An alternative history of abstraction. Hey everyone, thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, my name is Manuel Arturo Abreu. Here's uh, the Black Christ of Esquipulas uh, from Guatemala. Here are my epigraphs. Um, here I want to acknowledge, obviously, Discret and Atlanta Contemporary for digitally hosting me, uh, as well as to Atlanta itself, one of the most important black cities. Uh, thank you to my ancestors, family, friends, and of course, most of all, uh, my dear audience. I've also listed some people here who have influenced the research program in this lecture, as well as other aspects of research in my practice. Denise Morell says, the influence of traditional African aesthetics and processes is so profoundly embedded in Western artistic practice that it, it, it is only rarely evoked as such. Uh, okay, so here's a bit of a summary about this talk. Uh, a little bit about me, then the kind of who, what, where, when, why of abstraction, um, why abstraction, it's powerful, it's natural, it's fun, why an alternative history, because abstraction is black and brown, not white European, uh, where is abstraction, it's global, how does abstraction work, we briefly look at examples in history and in the present, uh, and then we also briefly talk about evolution and language and abstraction, focusing on Chomsky and biosemiotics. Um, and a kind of thesis statement of this talk is that this isn't an Africanization of abstraction or a vindication of how much Africans have contributed to the West by force or by choice. Rather, I intend to show the fact that abstraction is already black. Black abstract artists don't owe anything to the West unless they choose to. Okay, so yeah, this video will be on YouTube uh, for later. Uh, the main takeaway isn't uh, to build a canon of black abstraction through history because other people are doing that better. The takeaway is that if you're a black person watching this, you may find resonance with things in your own life and family history. And the main takeaway, if you're not black, is that you may want to find some black people and give them money immediately since you're probably aware to some level of uh, how much what you consume is uh, stolen from black people and forcibly extracted from black people, uh, whether in music or books or television, memes, language, sports, everything. And so in that sense, abstraction is kind of one more thing on that list. Uh, yeah, so I'm a Dominican poet and artist from the Bronx, mixed ancestry, African and European, currently living and working in Portland, Oregon. I received my Bachelor in Linguistics from Reed College in 2014. Um, my public practice, I'm interested in ephemerality. I work with what's at hand in a process of magical thinking with attention to the ritual aspects of aesthetics. So let's just jump right in. What is abstraction? In simple terms, abstract as opposed to concrete. Things that are concrete refer to other things in intuitive ways. They are about something uh, in the sense that you can point to it or easily conceive of it. So uh, on the one hand, there's clear reference. and On the other hand, uh, minimized cognitive effort or sensory effort. Um, things that are abstract may or may not refer to something. And if they do refer, it's in non-intuitive ways. Uh, ways that may take effort to conceive of. So with abstraction, we have unclear reference and maximized effort. Uh, and the metaphor is abstraction at its best, uh, as well as a critical tool of abstraction, uh, which proceeds from like to like in order to reach unlike. Abstract expression requires metaphor because of its unclear reference. Uh, proceeding from like to like in this metaphoric fashion is a way of relieving the cognitive effort that abstraction, by definition, maximizes. So we go through a couple of examples. Uh, two memes, one referring to this concept of too many tabs, one a quote on abstract art from Ghostface Killer, and one uh, the pencil speech from the first episode of Community.
bears have feet. We're the only species on Earth that observes Shark Week. Sharks don't even observe Shark Week, but we do. For the same reason, I can pick up this pencil, tell you its name is Steve, and go like this. Oh, and part of you dies. Just a little bit on the inside. Because people can connect with anything. We can sympathize with a pencil, we can forgive a shark, and we can give Ben Affleck an Academy Award for screenwriting. People can find the good in just about anything but themselves. So, uh, is everything abstract? Biosemiotics says that sign-related activity happens at the cellular level. Abstract things have more room for interpretation, but concrete things similarly require interpretation, right? Every change in the system is a signal, and the cell or the organism responds. There's a range of responses, and those, that range is considered agency in biosemiotics. So all things are like this. It doesn't matter how concrete or abstract they are. Uh, abstract things have more room for interpretation, and it's that more that we're interested in. So not the abstraction of the cell knowing it should go toward the area with greater sugar levels, let's say, uh, but the abstraction of naming of the pencil, as Jeff says, uh, which one can sense is tied into the structure of social activity and human identity, in the sense that it's productive, not just required, but productive. Uh, so I think of this in the sense of a kin versus kith abstraction. Abstraction which is kin or productive skillfully combines narrative and symbolism in a way that elucidates, right? So even if you're confused in the process of understanding, this confusion is in the service of some feeling or sense of, syn sense of synthesis, some greater meaning. So in this sense, uh, kin abstraction is still in a family relationship with meaning. Kith abstraction uh, challenges this elucidation and the use value of, of narrative in general. It has an ambivalent or even hostile relation to the production of narrative, symbolism, and meaning in general. So in this sense, it has severed family ties with meaning. So uh, yeah, I'm interested in both types. Uh, we look at examples from both ends of the continuum. But I do, uh, I confess, I guess, that I have an affinity for Kith abstraction. Okay, so why abstraction? Uh, why is it black and brown? Uh, if the abstract pairing of sound and meaning in systematic ways is the basis of language, and if language allows us to plan things and articulate possible worlds, then abstraction qua language is fundamental to human language. So, you know, that's a pretty strong why, I'd say. Uh, abstraction is black and brown. Well, more precisely, abstraction is universal, but currently the art world conceives of abstraction historically as white, emerging from Europe, because that's false, that's not reality, uh, we must argue for abstraction as black and brown um, simply because that's just that's reality, right? Uh, people are confused or lying. Uh, black and brown abstraction did not just inspire European modernism. Rather, the modernists participated in the ongoing European colonization projects. And so uh, when we resituate abstraction as black and brown, we also kind of reject this uh, reduction of it as just a contribution, and we'll talk about that later. Uh, so here's some uh, awesome memes by Freeze Magazine. All right, in this talk, I do uh, I bring up religion a lot, so I should explain why. Um, Abstraction is necessary and mystical as a way of making sense of things in the world. Questions about the nature of things, how to deal with this broken world that we inherit, how to live a good life, have shifted from one domain to another. Uh, for example, in the West, we see a transition of the thing occupying the central role in society from God to reason and science to ego and capital most recently. Uh, but no matter what's in the central role, the big, abstract haunting of those above questions remains big and abstract. Some shift doesn't make us all of a sudden feel whole or human. Uh, in this sense, I'm, I'm kind of echoing uh, Edward Said's argument that we are not yet secular, right? That we've covertly brought religious feeling back into quote-unquote secular contexts. And art is a great example of this. It really is a secularized uh, theological endeavor in the West. Most of the activity that we think of now as creative labor uh, at least up until conceptualism, 
in the 20th century, uh, it comes out of activity which historically was not labor at all, but was pious activity, right? Uh, religious examples um, are good and make sense because the project of reclaiming abstraction from its European colonized context as properly black and brown is also the project of engaging religion, um, then reason and science, then ego and capital, as major components of colonization of people and aesthetics. So we don't get into this uh, in this talk too much, but for example, we can look at the work of J. Cameron Carter in his book, uh, Race, a Theological Account. This is the church that I grew up in. Uh, my family is Pentecostal Protestant. This is a Philadelphia church in the South Bronx on uh, 156th and Prospect Avenue. Also, what about death, right? Uh, religion in one reductive sense is a palliative for death. Uh, and research in general, especially dealing with history, is a way of working with the dead. And it can take on a religious flavor, uh, which always fascinated me. The religious aesthetic of finding resonances in the natural world, these kind of resonances drive this project. So, for example, when St. Lucian poet Derek Walcott says, I never separated the writing of poetry from prayer. For me, it resonates as one potential analysis of African and Afro-diasporic aesthetic history. So much Afro-diasporic aesthetic activity happened under threat of death and in the lived reality of slavery's uh, social death, as Orlando Patterson calls it. Um, prayer retains its creative power in the face of this apocalypse, or ma-fa, uh, which is a term for African Holocaust, uh, which is, you know, we, we use this term to try to thicken the description around what actually the transatlantic slave trade did. Like, it wasn't just the theft of labor, but it was this... Uh, much more uh, totalized destruction and natal alienation uh, and ontological uh, exile from from uh, things like reason and humanity, civilization and history. We'll talk about this more later. Uh, the functional components of abstraction were driven to extremes in things like syncretism, for example, uh, in order to continue religious practice in secret religious dispensationalism or eschatological prophecy, uh, Marcus Garvey, for example, and ultimately survival itself, since surviving enslavement in its afterlife drove much, if not all, activity. Uh, so there, yeah, there's this triangulation happening between religion and death and necessity. Uh, functionality uh, it is not just traditionally African. Uh, it's also deployed in the context of uh, extreme oppression and so it kind of it kind of takes on this uh, dimension of resonating with its own origin if that makes sense uh, I think of this in the context of what Che Gossett calls diasporic intimacy okay so the West uh, moderniz modernism is Western colonization of black and brown aesthetics Modernism imposes debt relation on black and brown artists to conceal its own debt. Uh, we talk a bit about Malevich and Alphonse Allais, uh, the black-on-black -black racist lineage of Western abstraction, which is not hidden behind the black square, but rather immaterially presented, almost as an absent referent or a haunting. And then we talk about uh, the two Wests briefly. This idea that, on the one hand, if you hate the West, non-Wests are a good alternative, and if you love the West... You must acknowledge the critical contributions from the non-West by choice or by force without reducing uh, those non-Western aesthetics to just contribution. So these two things, uh, these, these two paths are open to us, I guess. Uh, and then we talk a little bit about Greeks in Africa. So if we do care about Western aesthetics to any degree, even the smallest degree, then this, uh, this lineage or this claim of... Uh, the African origins of Greek thought, right? Greek thought originating in Egyptian and Mesopotamian thought. Um, that might be relevant. So we talk a little bit about that. So European autonomy of art and colonization of abstraction. Europe's surface level stripping of functionality away from aesthetics actually conceals a deeper colonial function. Alongside material and spiritual colonization and aesthetic colonization, stole black and brown aesthetics for the revolutionary developments of modernism, 
Uh, and so with these developments, modernists went away from things like uh, illusionism, trying to depict reality uh, in this hyper-realist way, um, three-point perspective, all this kind of stuff. Uh, they were trying to move away from it. Uh, and further, following David Jocelyn, uh modernism imposes a debt relation on those from whom it colonized. Uh, alt alternative history of abstraction inverts this debt by showing that it is Europe who owes and that the sum is incalculable in the sense that paying it back means the end of the European project as we know it, let alone art. So, uh, you know, this is a very brief summary, but if anyone's interested in a longer uh, examination of some of these issues, the violence of modernism, uh, etc., I point uh, the audience to my essay Against the Supremacy of Thought, which Rhizome published in January 2018. So yeah, uh, this this whole thing about the racist joke behind the black square, uh, this was kind of a, a headline in 2015. Uh, I, I find it to be really misguided, actually. Like, I don't think that Malevich was hiding anything. I think he was explicitly uh, making a reference to the racist lineage of Western abstraction. Uh, and so, you know, what was found, right? If you haven't heard about this... Um, when they analyzed uh, Malevich's black square, I think it was under an x-ray or something, uh, they found that it had uh, Alphonse Allais uh, racist joke. Um, so here we see the original, it's from 1886, uh, and the caption to the monochrome says, um, uh, black people fighting in a cave at night. Uh, so this is kind of a series of uh, monochromatic jokes that Alaise did. Uh, he was part of this French movement, uh, the Incoherent Arts. So this kind of predecessor to Dadaism. Uh, so here's another example. Uh, Manipulation of Ochre by Jaundiced Cuckolds. Here's another one. Uh, funeral March composed for the funeral of a deaf great man and it's empty so uh, you know we can we can locate uh, John Cage within this racist lineage too funny enough so you know putting on my my quote unquote uh, art critic hat uh, <laughs> uh, we, we will have to say that Malevich is not this guy's not an idiot right he's not hiding this this line behind the black square like he didn't write that and then paint over it uh with a new idea he was immaterially referring to the lineage of, of alphonse allais and in the incoherent art the gesture of invisibilization is kind of a it's supposed to be super abstract it's supposed to gesture toward um the abstraction of, of that lineage so i reject the idea that it, the the racist joke is hidden under it i, I think actually uh, he's challenging people to uh, locate that lineage, uh, to, to view, to visibilize the immaterial, right? I mean, that's what abstraction is all about. It's about seeing the not seeable, the invisible. All right, and then we can turn to maybe some less ab abstract examples, some ab examples dealing with figuration. During the early 1900s, the aesthetics of traditional African sculpture became a powerful influence among European artists who formed an avant-garde. Matisse, Pablo Picasso, and their school of Paris friends blended the highly stylized treatment of the human figure in African sculptures with painting styles derived from the post-impressionistic works of Cezanne and Gauguin. The resulting pictorial flatness, vivid color palette, and fragmented cubist shapes helped to define early modernism. While these artists knew nothing of the origin, original meaning and function of the West and Central African sculptures they encountered, they instantly recognized, they instantly recognized the spiritual aspect of the composition and adapted these qualities to their own efforts to move beyond the naturalism that had defined Western art since the Renaissance. German Expressionist painters such, such as Kirchner of Die Brücke, uh, the bridge based in Dresden and Berlin, conflated African aesthetics with the emotional intensity of dissonant color tones and figural distortion to depict the anxieties of modern life, while Paul Klee of the Blue Rider in Munich developed transcendent symbolic imagery. The Expressionist's interest in non-Western art intensified after a 1910 Gauguin exhibition in Dresden, while modernist movements in Italy, England, and the United States 
initially engaged with African art through contacts with School of Paris artists. Starting in the 1870s, thousands of African sculptures arrived in Europe in the aftermath of colonial conquest and exploratory expeditions. They were placed on view in museums such as the Musée de Tourgraphie de Trocadero in Paris and its counterparts in cities including Berlin, Munich, and London. At the time, these objects were treated as artifacts of colonized cultures rather than as artworks and held so little economic value that they were displayed in pawn shop windows and flea markets. While artworks from Oceania and the Americas also drew attention, especially during the 1930s Surrealist movement, the interest in non-Western art by many of the most influential early modernists and their followers centered on the sculpture of sub-Saharan Africa. For much of the 20th century, this interest was often described as primitivism, a term denoting a perspective on non-Western cultures that is now seen as problematic. Uh, that's Denise Morel. Uh, pretty milk toast quote, obviously, and also pretty long, but just a good kind of overview of uh, the colonization of African aesthetics, of abstraction and modernism. So in this uh, project of locating uh, racist lineages in Western art, we reserve special loathing for Hegel. He argued that Africa is no historical part of the world. It has no movement or development to exhibit. So for Hegel, this justifies colonization. Yet, as though subconsciously drawing on African aesthetics, he writes of highly developed forms of art which lay the ground for what he calls the after of art, das nach der Kunst, that is, an after, i.e. a sphere which in turn exceeds art's mode of apprehending and representing the absolute, nothing less than the self-exceeding of art, yet within its own domain and in, in the form of art itself. We'll see later how African engagement with infinity and its commitment to functional, non-autonomous, socially embedded aesthetics is the best example of the after of art. You can at least say that Picasso as colonizer admits his engagement with African aesthetics, even admits his lack of understanding. Hegel, who likely knew of Africans in Europe like Ganibal, Pushkin's maternal great-grandfather who we discussed later, willfully banishes all Africa out of the world historical narrative. So there's two Wests, right? If you hate Western aesthetics, then non-Western aesthetics are a good alternative because in many cases they're much older, building on more developed traditions. Uh, and as well, in many cases, aesthetics has no pretense of autonomy from functionality or daily life. Whereas if you love Western aesthetics, then you must concede that various aesthetics by non-Western people, uh, including people colonized by the West, contributed greatly to the Western project. So just a, a large historical overview. Uh, um, so, for example, ancient Egypt, Ethiopia, and the Islamic world are large, largely responsible for safeguarding the Greek and Roman texts, while Europeans choked on their own shit and got genocided by a rat plague for a couple centuries. Rome, and to a lesser extent Greece, were massively diverse populations. Uh, Rome eventually fell to European tribes and then their descendants, um, who began whitewashing Greece and Rome. Uh, with Charlemagne's concept of a Holy Roman Empire, he tries to develop a, a claim for a lineage. Uh, meanwhile, of course, uh, Eastern Rome, or Byzantium, is, is going strong. Even though Rome fell, Constantinople and the Byzantine Empire still were going on. Uh, going strong might be a stretch. They were kind of in the Dark Ages. But, However, if you love the West um, and are interested in validating non-Western contributions to it, you need to be careful not to validate the West colonialism and imperialism, for example, by using the concepts that come out of it. Uh, and you need to be careful not to reduce non-Western participation to missing link status. So I call missing linkism uh, any analysis that justifies colonization of Africa as necessary and reinscribes inhumanity on African people for the continuous rendering of African people, land, culture, and aesthetics as raw material for Western development. Missing linkism can look like literally calling Africans monkeys and missing evolutionary links, saying Afro Afro-diasporic people are lucky to have had our ancestors enslaved, stolen, raped, etc. Um, but it also emerges in more liberal contexts, such as projects of reclaiming African contributions to the West, or arguing that slavery was evil but ultimately necessary for modernity. Well, you know, this is true, obviously. Slavery is necessary for modernity, and slavery still continues today. Um, but that's why modernity is evil, too. Right? Indeed, such missing linkism and its inherent violence is the basis of the liberal project. Hortense Spillers argues that if the black woman didn't exist, 
the United States would have needed to invent her in her groundbreaking 1987 essay, uh, Mama's Baby, Papa's Maybe, an American Grammar Book. Um, rejecting missing linkism, uh, we can and should continue to catalog African and non-Western contributions to the West because that stuff happened, and so that's the work of history. But philosophically, we can and should also understand the incommensurability at hand. African aesthetics is functional, so the idea of making something without a purpose is senseless. There's various long traditions where making and thinking is driven to cause things to happen in a social or spiritual sense. Once that function is achieved for the maker, thinker, or people, after whatever amount of time, hours, days, weeks, months, years, the object has served its purpose. So there's no precious, preciousness around its existence on its own uh, merit, separate from function. So even if we, even as we understand that many African tribes and Afro-Diasporic people were doing things that prefigured and were superior to Western abstraction, placing those things in a philosophically impoverished framework of quote-unquote art reduces and distorts the real purpose, function, and value of these objects in their respective contexts. So here's a meme about uh, the ancient scientist Jakob inventing the white man on the island of Padmos through generational grafting. Here's a meme by Atara Toast referencing the Arthur Fist meme in a Mondrian style. So ancient Greeks in Africa. Uh, Thales of Miletius and Pythagoras studied in the temples of Heliopolis, Memphis, and Thebes. Plato may have studied in Heliopolis. Many accounts corroborate this, but the timeline's confused. It may be that a student or acquaintance told Plato of the stories of their own travels. Uh, for example, Eudoxus of Snidus, etc. Uh, next slide, I'll have more details on that. Uh, Martin Bernal, in his book Black Athena, the Afroasiatic Roots of Classical Civilization, argues that in antiquity, people generally understood the large influence of Egyptian and Phoenician culture on Greek culture. He rejects the hypothesis that Central European, Indo-Europeans settled ancient Greece. Uh, this is the Aryan model. He argues instead for the ancient model that Egyptians and Phoenicians, as well as uh, Indo-Europeans, were the original settlers of Greek uh, culture, that it was a multicultural population. So yeah, it's an interesting proposal, but there's no archaeological evidence of Egyptian or Phoenician settlement in Greek territories. Here's a nice meme by At the Ankh Life. All these Greek philosophers studied on the continent of Africa. Um, so you got Anaxagoras there, Herodotus, Democritus, Thales, Aristotle, Socrates, Plato, Hippocrates. Got some, uh, some titans of ancient Greece, so to speak. Or the converse, ancient Africans in Greece. Uh, Frank Snowden, eminent scholar uh, of the classics, uh, takes great pains to show that antiquity had no real skin prejudice with respect to the Ethiops, as they called dark-skinned African settlers in Greece and Italy. At most, there was uh, uncertainty about their non-Hellenistic origins, and conflation of various tribes into one group, as we see in the name, uh, and also sometimes claims of greater than average abilities, so kind of the uh, ancient analog of stereotypes, we might say. Since there was no historical slippage uh, at the time between blackness and slaveness, and since slavery in the period was neither theological nor racial, the modern episteme would seem entirely foreign to ancient Greeks. Obviously, these people still had hate and bigotry and severe inequality in their social structures, but the articulation of oppression uh, was along different lines, not along racial lines. Here are the uh, citations about Plato in Africa. It's too much to go into, so I'm just going to keep going. Uh, here are two great books, Black Athena, which we discussed, as well as... Uh, uh, Guyanese author uh, George James's Stolen Legacy. Greek philosophy is stolen Egyptian philosophy. Alright, so let's start getting into some examples now that we've la laid out our framework and discussed the West. Um, first, let's talk about religious motivations for going against figuration. 
Uh, this is normally known as an iconism. An iconism is a framework developed from a Christian perspective to analyze quote unquote opposite traditions where icons and images are seen as idolatrous. We'll see that a totalizing frame like this is not useful, but it's still true that the idea of an iconism is tied to Abrahamic aesthetics and its conversation with Platonism. It is limiting to think of abstraction as somehow against figuration. Okay, uh, Abrahamic tradition holds a transcendent sense of divinity. The infinite is separate from all symbols, senses, reasons, causes, etc. Rather, the one true God concept is the uncaused cause of all the above and everything else. Questions emerge with respect to representation of the, the divine. Iconic representations depict the divine through the use of familiar figures, motifs, and frameworks. And iconic representations depict the divine without the use of iconic means. These traditions will represent the divine with things like pillars, stylized text, abstract, mathematical, logic-driven patterns, etc. Okay, so is there a Jewish aniconism? Uh, the, in the Tanakh, Exodus 20, uh, verse 4, says, Thou shalt not make unto thee a graven image, nor any manner of likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. And in chapter 11, of uh, the widely referenced and uh, widely considered authoritative Shulchan Aruch, or Code of Law from 1565, states, It is forbidden to make complete solid or raised images of people or angels or any images of heavenly bodies except for the purposes of study. Uh, even as that seems convincing, uh, we have to remember that these are ancient texts and don't necessarily reflect real culture and real history. They're just proscriptions from elite um, classes of society and their scribes. So, uh, Mark Michael Epstein argues against a Christian frame of aniconism uh, for analyzing Jewish aesthetics. He says, It is a fallacy to assert that Jewish culture was aniconic. The various halakhic interpretations of that commandment in practical terms prohibit only the creation of three-dimensional objects intended for Jewish worship. Various legists interpreted the commandment more stringently, of course, but it is indisputable that at most times and places, Jews did create monuments of visual culture, and they did so with enthusiasm, encountering little or no opposition from religious authorities. Rather than the, rather than the parlor trick debate with the straw man of Jewish aniconism, Epstein finds more interesting the analysis that Jewish visual art, quote, endeavors to blend the narrative and the symbolic in a complex and sophisticated way, working within the bounds of halakhic propriety, wherein representation in two dimensions, not intended for worship, was certainly countenanced, but in which embodiment was patently taboo. So somehow within uh, this matrix, Jews were yet able to manifest creativity in the realm of the visual in such a way as to give rise to forms that were analogous in higher theoretical function to the interventions of Christian art when it moved beyond the realm of the representational into the sphere of the embodying. The true, the true creativity here is the dance between the materialized and the abstract, between what is permissible to depict and what is forbidden. So I think this is a beautiful way of understanding uh, the way in which it's too simplistic to assume abstraction means non-figuration. Rather, abstraction is more about dealing with the limits of figuration and the limits of expression. So for example, here's a a fresco, a wall fresco from the Dura Europa synagogue in Syria from the third century. It depicts uh, Israelites crossing the Red Sea. Here is another one. This one's interesting. Uh, so it's a figurative depiction of idolatry, right? Pretty meta. Um, depicts the worship of the golden calf. And here's some, uh, here's a view of the environment. Here's 
here is a, an image of Jewish textual abstraction uh, from a Sephardic medieval manuscript. And then here we see uh, the Exodus of Egypt depicted in the Bird's Head Haggadah, uh, 14th century from the Upper Rhine of Germany. Uh, it's theorized that the use of the bird's heads was a way of avoiding the commandment against idolatry. Others analyze it as an uh, adoption of European medieval grotesque aesthetics, which often uh, depicted people in these kind of human-animal hybrids, or with uh, exaggerated features, or with somehow magical abilities, etc., Here's another Haggadah from the 14th century, this one from Barcelona. Here we see some nice fantastical creatures, as well as some beautiful uh, illuminations to the manuscript. Okay, uh, next, uh, Islamic Aniconism. Islam traditionally considered representation of living beings as idolatry. This reflects the influence of Platonism on thought in the Arab Empire. The Arabs and later the Islamic world, especially the Moors that conquered Spain in 711, were the keepers of Greek and Roman texts uh, during Europe's Dark Ages. Insofar as Europe has any access at all to the classics, it's through Islam. In religious contexts, Allah, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and anthropomorphic beings are not depicted. However, this is not the case in secular contexts for many Islamic societies throughout history. In the case of an iconism, a traditionally cited hadith which interprets a Quranic verse on idolatry, is from the Sahih Muslim, uh, collected by Muslim Ibn al Hajjaj in uh, the 9th century. Hadith 146 of Book 37 of Ibn al-Hajjaj's Sahih Muslim. Uh, Aisha reported that she bought a carpet which had pictures on it. When Allah's Messenger, peace be upon him, saw that, he stayed at the door and did not get in. I perceived, or as made, made to perceive upon his face, signs of disgust. She said, uh, Allah's Messenger... I offer repentance to Allah and His Messenger, peace be upon Him. But tell me, what is the sign that, what is the sin that I have committed? <laughs> Thereupon, Allah's Messenger, peace be upon Him, said, "What is this carpet?" She said, "I bought it for you so that you might sit on it and take rest." Thereupon, Allah's Messenger, peace be upon Him, said, "The owners of these pictures would be tormented, and they would be asked to bring to life whatever they tried to create." He then said. Angels do not enter the house in which there is a picture. So the blurring of text and image, reading and looking, uh, seeing and reading, has long been a feature of Eastern aesthetics. In the context of Islam, the fact that the Prophet, peace be upon him, received the Quran in Arabic gave the language a special status. Embellishments on it came to be seen as a form of piety, and many Islamic societies across the world respected calligraphers highly. Austere, blockier scripts in early calligraphy gave way to a golden age of arabesques. Calligraphic writing emerged as a symbol of splendor. Abstract calligraphy came to be an architectural component, a literal manifestation of the world being built from the Quran, which is an Arabic Quran, and a, a resonant frequency of the concept of logos, right? So here's a folio from the Blue Quran, uh, second half of the 9th to mid 10th century, uh, probably from Karawan in Tunisia. So here's an example of writing as architecture uh, inscriptions on the dome of the rock's walls. And uh, here we see the Alhambra. So here's some figuration. Uh, from the 16th century Ottoman Sieri Nebi, we see the marriage of Ali and Fatima. The two of them are depicted with heads aflame. So this avoids 
idolatry because it doesn't show their face, but it does have their body, so it's it's towing that line, right? So uh, one nice example of textual abstraction in calligraphy is the insignia of Sultan Suleiman I uh, in the 16th century of Istanbul, Ottoman Empire. Uh, it shows how textual abstraction can signify the nexus of theological celebration of the beauty of Arabic and the, bureaucrat the bureaucratic machine of imperial power. Uh, not only did the sweeping evocative abstraction of the insignia impress the eye and evoke various figures like peacocks and stuff, uh, peacocks uh, are imperial, obviously, it was also very difficult to copy, which protected against identity theft. Uh, and see Ektiar's essay, Ornament and Abstraction, in How to Read Islamic Calligraphy from 2018. So here's the insignia. It has a sense of organic movement to it that's very beautiful. And the, the apertures created in the shape uh, are filled with these beautiful, almost floral, fractal patterns. They're gorgeous. My name is Taha Al-Hiti. I'm an architect and an artist. When letters were created as an art, they were based on the human body. The letter would have a chest, the letter would have a lower part of the body, the letter would have a, uh, a neck. So you can see, for example, the alif, uh, which is the first letter equivalent to the A in, in, in Latin. Uh, the alif in Arabic is exactly the human posture. It has the uh, chest and the spine, which is leaning slightly forward, and it has the head of the letter. The spine, or the backbone of Islam, is the Quran, which is a holy book. The Prophet realized that the importance of preserving the Quran in such a way that it cannot be altered or changed. All this richness of, of culture that started brewing under the Islamic pot produced calligraphy in its sophisticated form that we follow until today. What is calligraphy? Calligraphy is a type of script invented after the revelation of the Quran in the Arabic language to make the words look more beautiful. Before that, the Arabic script wasn't considered artistic. But after the Quran was revealed, Muslims made it their mission to write it in a beautiful way. From one of the caves overlooking Mecca, Prophet Muhammad received his first revelation of the Quran, and it continued in pieces for the next 23 years. In the beginning, there were the Arabs, which were having the Prophet within their community, and started converting. Right. By the time the verses of Quran was coming in pieces, in longer short pieces, most of them were memorizing it because their culture was on memorization. They, they, they didn't leave any written material about their culture. Very, very limited, very less. After the passing of Prophet Muhammad in the early 7th century, Muslims compiled and transcribed the holy book marking a shift from an oral to a written religious tradition. Muslims were faced with another challenge. They could not use figurative arts to illustrate the essence of their preaching. When the Quran came in Arabic society, we were all idol worshippers. So this is the advice uh, for the Muslim community, not to have the risk of going back to the earlier faith or beliefs. Traditionally, calligraphy is used for writing verses from the Muslim holy book, the Quran. And its significance stems from the essence of the religion that forbids depicting God in any human form or living creature. And they didn't want uh, the Prophet himself as imaginary valuable item. Mm. So they avoided strictly not to draw any images of him. As a result, the script itself became a work of art. It is in the words of God, his verbal attributes, written down beautifully that Muslims feel his presence. The deep love for the Quran and the language of its origin became an artistic and spiritual inspiration for the Turks, allowing Islamic calligraphy to prosper and reach new artistic heights like never before. The medallions of Hagia Sophia, the walls of Suleymaniyah Mosque, the Kapi Palace and the Blue Mosque stand testament. So yeah, that's, that's the against figuration section. Ultimately, I think we can say that abstraction is a way of navigating the constraints of figuration rather than a full-on rejection of figuration.
this is kind of a, a Western reductive understanding of abstraction, that it would reject figure entirely. That's not the case at all in the older uh, alternative history of abstraction. The extreme attempts to break away from figuration actually point to how deeply interconnected figuration and abstraction are and how nuanced the dance is. So in this section we talk about uh, some examples of phenomena that are not uh, an iconic necessarily, but are equivocal toward legibility in the context of text, right? As we saw with Islamic calligraphy, uh, text is a main representational strategy of the aniconic. Not all examples of textual abstraction are aniconic in nature, though they still, they still have spiritual dimension to them. So the basis of rejecting legibility has to do with uh, allowing text to have the same agency as interpreter, that is to say, uh, as person. So when we assign agency to the text rather than the reader, we start to understand ways in which the text um, in and of itself has its own situation going on, so to speak, right? And if we sit back and kind of let textual agency express itself, we're, we'll learn a lot more than if we try to interpret and, and determine and limit text to our own whims. So I, I talk briefly about Tang era uh, calligraphy, then I talk about acemic writing, then I talk about wild style graffiti as well as some developments on wild style. Finally I talk about uh, the black religious acemic, specifically Hamptonese and J.B. Murray's spirit writing. Here in the western world, painting and writing are in general seen as distinct disciplines of practice. Although both can be creative in nature, and there are definitely contemporary artists who create text-based art, in most of Western history, the practice of writing has never really been a major player in the visual arts. This is not so much the case in other parts of the world. For millennia, as well as today, the art of calligraphy is a major artistic practice in many East Asian countries such as China, Japan, Korea, and Vietnam. Today, we're going to focus specifically on the history of Chinese calligraphy. Historically in China, many artists who painted picturesque scenes would have also been trained in the art of calligraphy. And artists would often write lines of poetry or prose along the sides of their painted scenes. In fact, during some historical periods, painting was often seen as a secondary practice compared to the prestigious practice of calligraphy. The primary reason the visual arts and the practice of writing are so closely linked in Chinese culture is due to the fact that the written characters themselves are pictograph based. When one writes a Chinese character, they are essentially drawing an abstracted picture. Thus, through the art of calligraphy, Chinese writers and poets were not only able to express their creativity and personalities through the meanings of the words they wrote, but also in the forms and the brush strokes of the words themselves. The Chinese form of writing, often referred to as characters or ideograms, are composed of usually square-shaped symbols, each representing a word or meaning. They evolved from an ancient pictograph-based language that was abstracted and simplified over time. For example, during the Chinese Bronze Age, the Shang Dynasty, roughly around 1400 BCE, the character for horse pretty much looked like this. Over time, it was standardized to fit into a square ratio. Then it was abstracted even further, and the modern symbol for horse looks like this. So from Kai Shu, stroke by stroke writing, the standard script, you evolve to Xing Shu with connected and sometimes omitted strokes. And then pretty naturally you will probably uh, think that if people write even faster, you will have another style. So let's talk about cursive. strokes, uh, curse of script, rather, curse of strip as Chao Shu,
okay, cursive strip, a cursive script rather. And in Kai Su, Sui, water, it's written stroke by stroke. In Xing Su, it's like that. And in Tao Su, it's like that. And that kind of cursive style give people a lot of uh, artistic uh, <coughs> freeway uh, uh, initiative. And so as choreographer who is also an artist, they kind of uh, <coughs> go to that extent to express themselves and uh, hence uh, came a lot of great uh, choreographer of Chao Su, uh, which is not the purpose of uh, this series, but uh, <coughs> we call it a curse of script because actually it wasn't evolved from Xing Su. Uh, it was developed long time ago when uh, official script was formed. The Li, Li Su was formed even before the Kai Su, so we call that a script. So cursive script, standard script was developed later on, and then from that evolved Xing Su. To understand the agency of the text is an act of spiritual submission. It's a way of disowning knowledge, letting go of certainty.
AC McWriting. So AC McWriting starts with Armi Michaud's Orientalism. Michaud uh, was a French artist fascinated by the trend toward illegibility in Eastern calligraphic traditions. He illogically conflated illegible semic writing with acemic. Uh, his contemporaries went on to develop techniques like surrealist automatism, itself drawing on Ming era Fuji uh, or uh, spirit or planchette writing, as well as European spiritualist automatic writing. So even as the acemic turn initiated with Michaud represents the West catching up to Eastern textual abstraction, it fundamentally misunderstood the work by conflating illegibility with meaninglessness. In contrast to such conflation, the legacy of non-Western textual abstraction and illegibility remains kin to meaning. There is still sense, even if it's not legible. So here's some work by Michaud. So, um... I want to talk a little bit about graffiti. I'm from the Bronx, and it's a big part of uh, my aesthetic origins, like where I where I came from aesthetically. Um, so to give a little bit of history of Wild Style, I've invited one of my best friends, uh, the graffiti writer Modus, to talk about Tracy 168, the history of Wild Style and graffiti, uh, the development of the aesthetic. Uh, here's his Instagram. Definitely check him out. He's a great artist. Hey everyone, uh, it's your boy, Modus at One ST, Letters First Crew, Seventh Letter, Writers Bench, OTM Crew. Um, today I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what Wild Style is. Uh, before I do that, I just want to give you a little brief background, real quick. Um, I'm a New York City graffiti writer. You know, born and raised. Um, I started writing graffiti probably back in the mid-2000s, let's say 2006, 2007, um, and I haven't stopped since. Um, Manny Abreu was the person who got me into graffiti, so I'm always indebted to Manny. Thank you, Manny. Um, so, yeah, let's get started. So, um, Wild Style. What is Wild Style? Well, off the rip. Um, wild style is a uh, aesthetic form of graffiti that is very complicated visually. Um, it's comprised of a lot of overlapping letters and shapes, um, colors, arrows, you know, little visual motifs that make it really difficult for the untrained eye to be able to read. Um, wild style is the most complex form of graffiti and the graffiti hierarchy, you know. Uh, we have tags, which are, you know, the little, basically signatures that you see on the streets, um, throw ups, which are the bubble letters that we see, and pieces. These are more refined forms of graffiti that have a lot of bold, bright colors and backgrounds. And within the piecing level, that's where Wild Style fits in. Um, so, but Wild Style is more than just an aesthetic or kind of graffiti piece. Um, and to talk a little bit more about wild, what Wild Style means, we need to go back to when graffiti in New York City was developing um, in the early 70s. Um, the term Wild Style actually comes from where, from somewhere, and that is from a legendary graffiti writer who goes by Tracy 168. Uh, he's a born and bred Bronxite, raised in the Bronx, um, and was a really pivotal figure in, you know, developing what graffiti will, you know, turn into today. Um, the term wild style was popularized by his crew, the wild style graffiti crew. Um, and the members of this crew were part of some of the most innovative and renowned writers in the scene of that time. So we're talking people like Tracy 168, uh, T Kid 170, Lava 1 and 2, Taki 183, Comet, Blade, Futura, Days, I mean the list, Dondi, the list goes on and on. Well, let me take that back. I don't know if Dondi's in it, but um, a lot of early writers who've now made the transition to the art world and are successful artists now um, started. What 
people need to also understand is that you know the new york city of the 1970s when the trains were getting bombed and you know destroyed with sick pieces it's not the same kind of city that it was today or it is today excuse me um you know there was a lot less oversight there was a lot more crime there was just a lot more shit happening back then on the street that could pop off at any time you know um so coming from this milieu you know i think it's important to realize that wild style is not only an aesthetic letter form in graffiti um you know tracy 168 you know the founder of the wild style crew will tell you himself like wild style is a way of life you know you're wild with styled you know in this chaotic urban jungle you're untamed with class you know wild style is the way you carry yourself it's the way you approach a mission. It's the way you wear your clothes. It's your mentality of life, you know? So I think fundamentally, beyond the letters, beyond the aesthetic, wild style kind of boils down to a more libidinal, let's, let's call it the libidinal economy. It, it taps into those like untamed energies and, you know, untamed forms um and are late and it becomes laid on top of it to the point where it becomes so grand and so complex that um you know people are in awe of the the character who encompasses wild style but also the artifacts that come from wild style the pieces that are left on the trains on the walls etc um so let me you know just end this by saying i am in no way um i wouldn't call myself an expert on wild style you know i'm definitely a dedicated practitioner of graffiti but you know to really understand wild style you really need to talk to a lot of the old heads who came from you know that time um and you need to you know talk to tracy 168 you know he's still around and kicking and i can definitely connect you with him peace stay up stay safe everyone much love signing out so here are uh, some Tracy 168 murals. Here's a Dondi mural from uh, early 80s. Here's a Rhyme mural. Uh, here's a piece by LA writer Revok. So Ramelzi uh, was one of the most influential and mystical contributors to early hip hop culture. He viewed wild style graffiti as the building blocks for developing weapon weaponry against technologies. He says the elevation of wild style knowledge is concluded as a symbol destroyer, armored medieval mechanism. Bottom right, we see his, uh, his graffiti tag. It's it's very difficult to read. And then bottom left, we see uh, one example of his conception of weaponizing uh, graffiti stylizations. So, for example, the star, a uh, pretty common motif in different graffiti tags and different uh, graffiti mural uh, designs, is labeled here as star-based extender militarily the unreadable uh, here's some Ramel Z sketches here's a more elaborate uh, two more elaborate diagrams of his concept of weaponizing the abstraction of wild style so here we see that um, the idea of building the letter and abstracting on it in this additive process, Ramel Z uh, understands it as a weapon and as a velocity, right? So the natural metaphor for this is a vehicle, a, a ship or a car or something. Uh, and so here we see uh, essentially what look like rocket ships or missiles. And so he'll also render these weaponized letters as uh, what he called letter racers. So these, uh, these are assemblages of found objects that are meant as... Um, three-dimensional manifestations of the letter form sketches 
to kind of depict this via uh, vehicular metaphor for weaponized abstraction. He also did performances with these costumes that he built. Um, he rapped and uh, often in his performances would uh, incorporate theatrical aesthetics. He also did uh, sculptural collage. And here we see some of the letter racers uh, installed in context with one of the costumes. So yeah, he passed in 2010, uh, but his influence is still deeply felt throughout different aspects of hip-hop culture. Hampton Knees. Uh, we look at James Hampton's The Throne of the Third Heaven of the Nation's Millennium General Assembly in more detail later, but for now, we turn to one aspect of the construction of this magnum opus, uh, Hampton Ease, an undeciphered script James Hampton used in his notebooks. We have 164 pages of Hampton Ease available for analysis. Stamp and Lay's 2005 paper using hidden Markov models bears interesting results, but the authors conclude that there's a very real possibility that in spite of its language-like appearance, Hampton Ease is simply the written equivalent of speaking in tongues, which I find a, a very compelling idea, uh, because if so, it's a kind of black theological asemic, with presumably a function in Hampton's overall project, uh, which is a theological project, not an artistic project. So here are a couple pages from uh, Hampton's notebooks written in Hamptonese. Sometimes there's a, a perfect word in another language. Mm -hmm. that, like English doesn't have the word for what I'm really trying to say, or it doesn't translate exactly. Oh, a lot of people say that, like, oh, I'll be having that same problem because I'll be having to say something. I'll be like, man, how do you say Elena Roshi in English? <laughs> I can't really, there's not really a because what I want to say is, ah, yeah, that they said it. I can't really translate that into English. You gotta, you really gotta understand the, the tongues of it. So, uh, J.B. Murray's spirit writing. Another example of a black theological acemic practice. Uh, he used Christian like he used us as we let him use a little clear enough time for him to use his estimate of the Holy Spirit on us. Ain't nothing he start before he don't finish it. 
I'm going to stand on his word and he will make a way. And I thank you, Jesus. Amen for that. All right. All right, so. Lord. 
and he spoke with water. Water will be God better than anything in the world. And it was the strongest thing in the world. It can rain, and on part of it, on the, the lower water waterfall, part of it will be dry. And you go around further, you strike a, a stream. And you go below that stream, you strike a dry spot. Jesus. He moves and Jesus ways in wonderful forms. When I was going on to take the place, you had me, Father, bound and compensated, said to put me down until my son get out. He had me on his bond, and he wasn't guilty of all. Ethnophilosophy uses the tools of ethnography to consider cultures and forms of life as fully-fledged expressions of full philosophies. So it's this question of, do we find philosophy in culture or not? Some pro-ethnophilosophy thinkers include Leopold Senghor, Placide Tempels, and Alexis Kagame. How people live, they argue, can express something like a philosophy, a system dictating how to live, what existence means, etc. Paulin Untonji is probably the most illustrious anti-ethnophilosopher. For him, ethnophilosophy cannot escape its originary coloniality, which essentializes Africa as a static monolithic entity. As well, if philosophy is about truth and culture is about how things are, then those two are always going to be separate, and philosophy can only be found in itself, in the work of philosophical thought proper, not in cultural activity. So even though aspects of philosophy may begin or draw from culture, it eventually must abstract away from culture to reach truth, in a kind of inward turn. So Huntonji instead argues that African philosophy is all philosophy by and for Africans, in a kind of critical universalism. And some take his universalism as a sort of Eurocentrism. Uh, so Kagame, for example, writes, Untonji, but he's white. Untonji's approach, informed by his teacher, uh, Husserl, strikes me because it commits to something inhuman. Truth isn't found in human culture, and for Untonji, the contributions to culture are left to the artist. Truth precedes humans, precedes this universe in all senses, uh, so a potential critique against Suntoji, obviously. Uh, all philosophy is ethnophilosophy, with actual philosophy solely as a horizon 
something we haven't actually reached yet. Even if we follow Huntonji in arguing that traditional African knowledge systems do not constitute philosophy per his definition, in fact, especially if we adopt this anti-ethnophilosophical universalist conceit, we can go ahead and redefine the scope of analysis from philosophy uh, to more abstractly just gener general gestures of abstraction wherever we may find them in human activity. Shouts out. Huntonji right here. The idea that concepts like art, philosophy, reason, and humanity are incommensurate ways of understanding African aesthetics and colonial encounter draws on Afro-pessimist thought. We saw earlier, for example, how Hegel constructs history in contrast with Africa, i.e. by means of its exclusion. All these concepts work that way. Frank Wilderson III argues that human as a concept requires the construction of black as its outside or foil in order for human to exist as a cogent category. So in a sense, this Afro-pessimist approach is actually more universal than Huntonji's anti-ethnophilosophy. -ethno by choosing not to commit to the outside, right? Huntoji believes in a universalism outside of colonialism. Um, but Afro pessimists would say, no, there is no outside. All universalist concepts, including universalism, are colonial and, and anti black and reinscribe uh, social death and dehumanization and natal alienation of African and Afro diasporic people. So uh, a notion of being against history, that is to say, against histories and presence of anti-black constructs like the above, allows a non-linear perspective of time to emerge. So this isn't a theological idea that linear time is suffering or punishment. Rather, it draws on Wilson Harris's notion of quantum fiction. Lots of different things are happening all at the same time, parallel universes impact each other, and history is unfinished resonating and replaying itself out every day in infinite immaterial structures of haunting and absent presence. Uh, if you're interested in Wilson Harris, I gave a talk about him at the Studio Museum in Harlem. Digitality is African. Silicon is not the only way to create a networked culture. Ron Eglash traces a lineage such that every digital circuit in the world is African, but mono pseudo random number generation and their divination uh, was collected, was trans, was witnessed and written about by Islamic mystics, who exposed it to Hugo Santalia, who exposed it to Leibniz, who wrote on geomancy and Iberian alchemy. Uh, building on this, Leibniz writes in De Combinatoria about ones and zeros as a way of notating the the divination system. George Boole builds on this with Boolean algebra. And John von Neumann uh, codifies Boole's analysis into the circuit. So every digital circuit in the world is African. Uh, syncretism is not diasporic, but mainland African. After all, intra-African intra tribal contact is as syncretic as African-European contact. Some examples include Congo religious syncretism, uh, Dahomeyan assemblage and syncretism in the case of the Voduns and Orishas. And then we also uh, discuss this idea of fetish. By 1460, Portugal had already distinguished feticio from idolo. Fetish is used to devalue African spirituality and functional aesthetics and came to wide use through Marx and Freud as a metaphor for pathological or false conscious understandings of value. I want to start my story in Germany in 1877 the mathematician named George Cantor. And Cantor decided he was going to take a line and erase the middle third of the line, and then take those two resulting lines and bring them back into the same process, a recursive process. So he starts out with one line, and then two, and then four, and then 16, and so on. And if he does this an infinite number of times, which you can do in mathematics, he ends up with an infinite number of lines, each of which has an infinite number of points in it. So he realized he had a set whose number of elements was larger than infinity. And this blew his mind, literally. He checked in the sanitarium. And when he came out of the sanitarium, he, he was convinced that he had been put on Earth to found transfinite set theory because the largest set of infinity would be God himself. He was a very religious man. He's a mathematician on a mission. And other mathematicians did the same sort of thing. Uh, Swedish mathematician von Koch decided that instead of subtracting lines, he would add them. And so he came up with this beautiful curve. 
And there's no particular reason why we have to start with this seed shape. We can use any, uh, any seed shape we like. And uh, I'll rearrange this and I'll stick this somewhere down there, okay. And uh, now upon iteration, that seed shape sort of unfolds into a very different looking structure. So these all have the property of self-similarity. The part looks like the whole. It's the same pattern at many different scales. Now mathematicians thought this was very strange because as you shrink a ruler down, you measure a longer and longer length. And since they went through the iterations an infinite number of times, as the ruler shrinks down to infinity, the length goes to infinity. infinity. This made no sense at all. So they consigned these curves to the back of the math books. They said, these are pathological curves and we don't have to discuss them. <laughs> and that worked for 100 years. And then in 1977, Benoit Mandelbrot, a French mathematician, realized that if you do computer graphics and use the, these shapes he called fractals, you get the shapes of nature. You get uh, the human lungs, you get acacia trees, you get ferns, you get these beautiful natural forms. If you um, take your, your, your thumb and your index finger and look right where they meet, go ahead and do that now, and, and relax your, your, your hand, you'll see a crinkle and then a wrinkle within the crinkle and a crinkle within the wrinkle within, right? Your body is covered with fractals. The mathematicians who were saying these are pathological useless shapes, they were breathing those words with fractal lungs. It's very ironic. And I'll show you a little natural recursion here. We, we, again, we just take these lines and recursively replace them with the whole shape. So, so here's the second iteration, third, fourth, and, uh, and so on. So nature has this self-similar structure. Nature uses self-organizing systems. Now in the 1980s, I happened to notice that uh, if you look at an aerial photograph of an African village, you see fractals. And I thought, this is fabulous, I wonder why. And of course, I had to go to Africa and, and ask folks, why? Um, so I got a Fulbright uh, scholarship to, to, to uh, just travel around Africa for a year asking people why they were building fractals, uh, which is a great job if you can get it. And so I, I, fi I finally got to the city um, and I'd done a, a, a little fractal model for the, the city just to see how, how it would sort of unfold. But when I got there, um, I got to the, 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 this palace of the chief uh, and my French is not very good. I said something like, I'm a mathematician and I would like to stand on your roof. Um, but he was really cool about it. He took me up there and we talked about fractals. And, and he said, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we know a rectangle within a rectangle within a rectangle. We know all about that. And it turns out the royal insignia has a rectangle within a rectangle within a rectangle. And the path through that palace is actually this, this spiral here. And as you go through the, the paths, you have to get more and more polite. So they're mapping the social scaling onto the geometric scale. It's a conscious uh, pattern. It is, it is not unconscious like a, a termite mound fractal. Uh, this is a, a village in southern Zambia, the ba Baila, uh, built this village, it's about 400 meters in diameter. Um, you have a huge ring. The rings that uh, represent the family enclosures get larger and larger as you go towards the back. And then you have the chief's ring here in, 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 uh, towards the back, and then the chief's uh, immediate family uh, in that ring. So here's a little fractal model for it. Here's one house with the sacred altar. Uh, here's the house of houses, the family enclosure. Uh, with the, the humans here where the sacred altar would be. And then here's the village as a whole, a ring of ring of rings uh, with the chief's extended family here, the chief's immediate family here. And then here, there's a tiny village only this big. Now you might wonder how can people fit in a tiny village only this big? That's because they're spirit people. It's the ancestors. And of course the spirit people have a little miniature village in their village, right? So it's just like George Cantor said, the, the, the recursion continues forever. This is in the Mandara Mountains near the Nigerian border in, in Cameroon, Mukulek. I, I saw this diagram drawn by a French um, architect and I thought, wow, what a beautiful fractal. So I tried to uh, come up with a seed shape which upon iteration would unfold into this thing. I came up with this uh, structure here. Let's see, first iteration, second, third, fourth. Now, after I did the simulation, I realized the whole village kind of spirals around just like this, and here's that repli replicating line, self-replicating line that, that unfolds into the fractal. Well, I noticed that line is about where the only square building in the village is at. 
So when I got to the village, I said, can you take me to the square building? I think, you know, something's going on there. And they said, well, we can take you there, but you can't go inside because that's the sacred altar where we do sacrifices every year to keep up those annual cycles of fertility from the fields. And I started to realize that the cycles of fertility were just like the recursive cycles in the, the geometric algorithm that builds this. And the recursion in some of these villages continues down to very tiny scales. So here's a, a Nankani village in Mali. And you can see you go inside the family enclosure, you go inside, and here's pots in the, the fireplace stacked recursively. Here's uh, calabashes that, that uh, uh, Issa was just showing us, and they're stacked recursively. Now, the tiniest calabash in here keeps the woman's soul. And when she dies, they have a ceremony where they break this stack called the zalanga, and her soul goes off to, to eternity once again. Uh, once again, infinity is important. Now, you might ask yourself three questions at this point. Aren't these scaling patterns just universal to all indigenous architecture? And that was actually my original hypothesis. When I first saw those African fractals, I thought, wow, so, so any indigenous group that doesn't have a state society that's in a hierarchy must have a kind of bottom-up architecture. But that turns out not to be true. I started collecting aerial photographs of um, Native American, South Pacific architecture. Only the African ones were, were fractal. Uh, and if you think about it, all these different societies have different um, geometric design themes that they use. So, so Native Americans use a combination of circular symmetry and fourfold symmetry. Uh, and you can see them in the pottery and the baskets. Here's, a, here's an aerial photograph of uh, one of the Anasazi ruins. You can see it's circular at the largest scale, but it's rectangular at the smaller scale, right? It is not the same pattern at two different scales. Uh, second, you might ask, well, Dr. Eglash, aren't you ignoring the diversity of African cultures? Uh, and, and three times the answer is no. Uh, first of all, I agree with uh, Mudimbe's wonderful book, The Invention of Africa, that Africa is, is an artificial invention of first colonialism and then oppositional movements. Um, no, because a widely shared design practice doesn't necessarily give you a, a, a unity of culture, and it definitely is not in the DNA. Um, and finally, the fractals have self-similarity. So they're similar to themselves, but they're not necessarily similar to each other. You see very different uses for fractals. It's a shared technology in Africa. And finally, well, isn't this just intuition? It's not really mathematical knowledge. Africans can't possibly really be using fractal geometry, right? It wasn't invented in, in, until the 1970s. Well, it's true that some African fractals um, are, as far as I'm concerned, just pure intuition. So some of these things, you know, I would wander around the streets of Dakar asking people, well, what are the, what's the algorithm? What's the rules for making this? And they'd say, well, you know, we just make it that way because it looks pretty stupid. Uh, but sometimes, sometimes that's not the case. In some cases, uh, there would actually be algorithms and very sophisticated algorithms. So in Mengwetu sculpture, you see this recursive geometry. In uh, Ethiopian crosses, you see this wonderful unfolding of the shape. Um, in uh, Angola, the uh, Chokwe people draw lines in the sand, and it's what German mathematician Euler called a, a, a graph. We now call it an Eulerian path. You can never lift your stylus from the surface, and you can never go over the same line twice. But they do it recursively, and they do it with an age grade system. So the little kids learn this one, and then the older kids learn this one, and then the next age grade initiation, you learn this one. And with, with each iteration of that algorithm, you learn the, the, the iterations of the myth. You, you learn the next level of knowledge. And finally, all over Africa, you see this board game. Uh, it's called Awari in Ghana, where I studied it. It's called uh, Mankala here on the East Coast, Bao in uh, Kenya, Sogo elsewhere. Uh, well, you see self-organizing patterns that spontaneously occur in this board game. And the, the folks in, in Ghana knew about these self-organizing patterns and would use them strategically. So this is very conscious knowledge. Here's a, a wonderful fractal. Uh, anywhere you go in the Sahel, you'll see this, this, uh, this windscreen. And of course, fences around the world are all Cartesian, all strictly linear. But here in Africa, you've got these nonlinear scaling fences. So I, I tracked down one of the folks who makes these things, this guy in, in uh, Mali just outside of Bamako, and I asked him, how come you're making fractal fences? Because nobody else is. And his answer was very interesting. He said, well, if I lived in the jungle, I would only use the long rows of straw because they're very quick and they're very cheap. Doesn't take much time, doesn't take much straw. He said, but wind and dust goes through pretty easily. Now, the tight rows up at the very top, they really hold out the wind and dust but it takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of straw because they're really, really tight. Now, he said, we know from experience that the farther up from the ground you go, 
the stronger the wind blows, right? It's just like a cost-benefit analysis. And I measured out the lengths of straw, put it on a log-log plot, got the scaling exponent, and it almost exactly matches the scaling exponent for the relationship between wind speed and height in the wind engineering handbook. So th these guys are right on target for, for a practical use of, of uh, scaling technology. The most complex example of uh, an algorithmic approach to fractals that I found was actually not in geometry, it was in a symbolic code. And this was uh, Bamana sand divination. And the same divination system is found all over Africa. Um, you can find it on the East Coast as, as, well, as well as the, the West Coast. And often the, the, the symbols are, are very well preserved. So, so uh, each of these symbols has uh, four bits. It's a four-bit binary word. You draw these lines in the sand randomly. Uh, and then you count off. And if it's an odd number, you put down one stroke. And if it's an even number, you put down two stroke. And they did this uh, very rapidly. And I couldn't understand where they were getting, they only did the randomness four times. I couldn't understand where they were getting the other 12 symbols. Uh, and they wouldn't tell me. They said, no, 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 I can't, I can't tell you about this. I said, well, look, I'll, I'll pay you. You, know, you can be my teacher and, and, and I'll come each day and pay you. So oh, it's not a matter of money. You know, this is a religious matter. And finally, out of desperation, I said, well, let me explain George Cantor in 1877. And I started explaining you know, why I was there in, in Africa. And they got very excited when they saw the Cantor set. And uh, one of them said, you know, come here, I, I think I can help you out here. And so he took me through the initiation ritual for, for a, a Bum and a priest. Um, and of course, I was only interested in the math. So the whole time he kept shaking his head going, you know, I didn't learn it this way. But I, I had to sleep with uh, a kola nut next to my bed, buried in sand, and give seven coins to seven lepers and, and so on. Um, and finally, he, he, he revealed the, uh, the truth of the matter. Uh, and it turns out it's a pseudo-random number generator. They're using deterministic chaos. When you have a, a four-bit symbol, you then put it together with another one sideways. So even plus odd gives you odd. Odd plus even gives you odd. Even plus even gives you even. Odd plus odd gives you even. So it's addition modulo two, just like in the parity bit check on your computer. Uh, and then you, you take this symbol and you put it back in. So it's a self-generating diversity of symbols. They're, they're truly using a, a kind of deterministic chaos in doing this. Now, because it's a, a, a binary code, you can actually implement this in hardware. What a fantastic teaching tool that should be uh, in, in African engineering schools. And the, the most interesting thing I found out about it was uh, historical. In the 12th century, Hugo of Santalia brought it from Islamic mystics into Spain. Uh, and there it entered into uh, the, 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 uh, the alchemy community as geomancy, the, 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 the divination through the earth. This is a geomantic chart drawn by uh, uh, for, the, for King Richard II in 1390. Leibniz, the German mathematician, talked about geomancy in his dissertation called De Decombinatoria. And he said, well, instead of using one stroke and two strokes, let's use a one and a zero. And we can count by powers of two, right? Ones and zeros, the binary code. George Boole took Leibniz's binary code and created Boolean algebra, and John von Neumann took Boolean algebra and created the digital computer. So all these, these little PDAs and, and laptops, every digital circuit in the world, started in Africa. And I, I, I know uh, Brian Eno says there's, there's not enough African in computers, but you know, I don't think there's enough African history in Brian Eno. <laughs> Fractals express the basic informatic or virtual structure of the universe. They can serve as a structuring principle, not only in language and culture, but also in the architecture of village buildings and social structure. Infinity is divine. This starts with the exponentiality of genealogy. Syncretism as the merging of two distinct cultural elements started on the African mainland. There's a long history of interaction between the Fon Ewe people and the Yoruban people. For example, uh, Yoruban Oisha Eshu Elegbara is almost cognate to Fon Ewe Vodun Legba. Some people say it's the same, actually. Uh, likewise for the Orisha Ogun and the Vodun Gu. The kingdom of Dahomey often incorporated religious elements from non Fon Ewe tribes as well as from encounters with Southeast Asia. Certain Congo people converted voluntarily to Christianity after an encounter with the Portuguese, who arrived on the African mainland in 1441 and began settlement in earnest in 1460. The use of deterministic chaos and various divination practices of West, Central, and South Africa speak to long histories of interaction and high-level theological conversation around infinity between the various peoples who practice these techniques. On the left, we have... Uh, a sculpture of Eshu Elegbara, the Yoruban Orisha. And on the right, we have a sculpture of the Fon Ewe Vodun uh, Legba. 
So some of the resonances we see. Uh, Eshuetic Bada wears necklaces of cowrie shells. The cowrie shells are directly on the chest of Legba. The musical horns that Eshuetic Legbara holds in his hands uh, are transformed into horns on the head of Legba. Um, the sort of phallic distinctive hat that Eshuetic Legbara wears is transformed into a straight up dick in Legba. Both of them are omniglots, keepers of the gate. You meet them at the crossroads. Both of them are the gatekeepers between universes, between the world of the living and the dead, between parallel universes. Uh, both of them are arbiters of the informatic. Both of them need to be uh, respected and addressed respectfully before any communication across universes. There's a lot of similarities there that speak to a long history of relationships between the Fon Ewe people and the various Yoruban and non-Yoruban tribes of the Oyo Kingdom. So yeah, uh, this this aspect of the syncretism of Christianity, um, there is ancient syncretism and medieval syncretism. In antiquity, many early titans of Christian of Christian theology were North African, and that just cannot be understated. The ascetic Desert Father theology comes out of North Africa. Uh, originary concepts of Christian confession-based thinking uh, and ethics come out of North Africa, for example, in Augustine. And so here we have some examples. So Christianity really is African originally. Charlemagne's decision to claim real inheritance of Rome and thus usher in the Western European project was a form of whitewashing. Here's Augustine. Here's Perpetua and Felicity. Here's Moses. Not Moses from the Bible, St. Moses. Here's King Caleb or St. Elasbon. This one looks a little different from the other ones because it's a, a Ethiopian icon. Uh, they have their own tradition and it's really beautiful. For example, here we see one of the disciples getting their feet washed by Jesus. Here's a nice little diagram of the saints of Africa. Uh, Mattery points out how Freud... Uh, deploys a fetishized Africa in opposite rhetorical ways, depending on context, sometimes as the anti-type of civilized humanity, and sometimes as the prototype of a shared humanity. Yet both, both formulations are stu studiously ignorant of African self-understandings and aspirations, reducing Africans to rhetorical tropes rather than human beings. So we need to talk about Black American abstraction. <clears throat> a critical component of decolonizing American art is recentering Southern Black American abstraction in the history and present of American art. Uh, for example, Deborah Solomon argues that Rauschenberg owes more to Black Southern found sculpture and yard art than to Duchamp. So we talk about G's Ben quilt makers, Du Bois' data visualization, Southern yard art, and we return to James Hampton. Alice Walker wrote that when the poet Gene Toomer walked through the South in the early 20s, he discovered a curious thing. Black women whose spirituality was so intense, so deep, so unconscious, that they were themselves unaware of the richness they held. They dreamed dreams that no one knew, not even themselves. They waited for a day when the unknown thing that was in them would be made known. <coughs> for these grandmothers and mothers of ours were not saints, but artists, creators, who lived lives of spiritual waste because they were so rich in spirituality, which is the basis of art. My name is Louisiana Bendoff. I was born here in G's Bend in 1960, and we lived on a farm. We got up early. We got up around six o'clock, and we would you know, eat something and then we would go to the fields. And then we would work until around six, the sun going down again. So we would have to come out the field and get the wood, pump the water and 
Then the next morning, we do the same thing. If it rained, we went to school. If not, then we were in the fields. When I was 12, I made my first quilt. Quilting was always around us, because back then in G's Bend, it was really cold. And so it was something that was done because we needed it. I get my design from my mind. I be sitting there and thinking about how I wanted to make a queer. And then he just come in my head how I wanted to make it. I piece it with the machine. And then when I get ready to quilt it, I get a, the lining and the bedding. That's good. Roll this up for you. Come on, now it's time. And that you would put into frames. You get a chance to see a quilt frame that we use and work horses that carpenter used to build on it. We use them as quilting frame. We call them our quilting horses. And we put them in the frame and, and that's how we quilt. There's three layers to a quilt and you would have to quilt all those layers by hand. When we be sitting around the quilt, we be talking about the Lord and talking about how our kids act and we be praying, and we be singing, we be moaning, and then sometimes we be snacking on the queer, have some fruit or something on the queer, and we be snacking on the queer. I decided to try to find my own identity in quilt making. So I wanted to make a quilt to honor my mom and Alonzo, which is my mom's first cousin. My mom's favorite color is hot pink. So I decided, I said, I make something with hot pink and I make something that's kind of easy, but I put a twist in it. And so I decided to put a triangle, not quite into the center of the quilt, but off to the side and kind of like a window. I love looking out of windows. I always have since I was a little girl. And I said, and this is kind of like looking back into my past. Looking back into the past, but not quite going all the way back into the past. Joseph G. came from North Carolina in the early 1800s and brought some slaves. This was still territory when Joseph G. came. He was the first one to, to get this land as, as a land grant from the government. And he lived here for a good little while, but then he got sick and he let this land go to his cousins, the Petways. Petway came down uh, from North Carolina he brought his slaves with him, and they say he had a hundred or so slaves. And they all walked, with the exception of one, and that was the cook. And they didn't want the cook to walk because they want the cook to stay clean and not be dirty. So when they came into the, the area, the Petways inherited the, the plantation from their uncle, Joseph G. So it became the Petway Plantation, so everyone who came on the plantation, their last name became Petway. During the Great Depression, there was two photographers that came down to photograph G's being living style and evidently it had a very important impact on the Roosevelt administration. The price of cotton fell way below five cents a pound. So times got hard here in G's Bend and the people in Camden began to foreclose on some of the, the farmers here and took all their corn, the livestock to include cattle, pigs and everything. So the people here were pretty much left to starve. But somehow 
Red Cross got the word and they came in and started bringing in, you know, food to help out. It was really hard when I was growing up. We had nothing but the fireplace and the stove and the kitchen to keep warm. And we had to make quilts to keep warm. At that time, it was like a 10,000 acres farm uh, that was owned by the plantation owner. So the government came in and purchased the farm from the white plantation owner and then turned around and subdivided the community into like 100 different units. And with that unit, there came a, a house, a smokehouse, a hen house, an art house, and a barn. And it also had like 140, sometimes 145 acres of land to go with it. And they gave them 40 years to pay for it at a price of um, about $2,700 per house. This is one of my favorite quilts in the exhibition, and we selected it for the opening. I guess for me, this sort of epitomizes one of the first things I felt about the quilts, is that you were looking at place, at the geography of the area. And it was as though you were just flying over the fields and the houses. And in photographs, I think it's very hard to understand the textures in these quilts, the subtlety of pattern, the faded fabrics, which are the sort of remnants of people's lives. And I like old material. I like khakis, I like jeans, I like gangnam shirts, corduroy, but new material. I don't like new clothes. It's too hard to work with. I like something been worn, a lot of love, and a lot of softness. These are the sort of the basic, what we think of as the basic building blocks of the G's Ben quilt pattern. It's the house top and the brick layer quilts. The idea is using rectangles and squares of fabric to build up your design. And the quilters themselves have said that making a quilt is like building a house. You start with one room here, you add another, and keep on adding on. And that's exactly how these have been created. Taking a few basic designs, they run with them, and they've made them their own, and are able to create infinite variety from just, you know, a few basic shapes. I call this quilt a crazy quilt, because it put together all sorts of ways. And my mind said, call it a crazy quilt, and that's what I call it, crazy quilt. I always had a mind to do so, and if you want to do so, you could do. It ain't nothing we can't do if we want to do. And I believe that to my heart. The switch from quilt to print, it all worked together because making a print is just like making a quilt. This quilting practice has been going on for a very long time, probably a couple centuries. Not only does this occasion a radical shift in Western periodism, this work is made in the West but also in reality African. So it evinces a networked relation across the brutality and void of the Middle Passage. As we spoke about before, these are gestures of diasporic intimacy. So there's this idea of privileging women in abstraction that I want to explore. For a while now, white men have defined themselves as actors and agents, going into the world, achieving things, providing for the unit. They wanted women to stay behind, attend to domestic spheres. Instead, 
neither worked. The people they enslaved, it did. Instead, neither men, white men nor women worked. The people they enslaved did. Abstraction requires a great deal of stillness and contemplation. If men want so badly to act, rather than think, they need to step aside in abstract contexts. Centering a black abstraction means centering black women. Enslaved Aphrodite people were forced to do whatever the master desired, but then black women also had to do this for men. Who is most oppressed knows the war best, and censoring the freedom of the most oppressed also helps everyone else. But black women may also reject this call to utility in favor of abstraction. We must clear a place of stillness and peace for black women. The specific life experiences for black women prime them for philosophical inquiry. Life itself is hell. The mind is the only respite. Many marginalized African practices were maintained and passed down in maternal lines. This further indicates the privileged place women hold in relation to abstraction. Women stewarded and modified pre-colonial lineages, lineages which continue today, some in secret, some hiding in plain sight, some assimilated into mainstream culture. <laughs> some assimilated into mainstream culture. In the work of discarding provincial European periodisms of abstraction for a longer view, the only real way to make progress in terms of historical analysis is to center the production and retention of culture by the maternal line. The void which genealogy represents for Aphrodite's people resonates with the idea of abstraction as void or emptiness. A massive gap between mainland and diaspora opens up with the violence of the Middle Passage, akin to emptying out the holy. The efforts of Aphrodite's people to cross that fathomless distance are a kind of oceanic or transatlantic intimacy. That is to say, the void, the conceptual, etc., are the domain of the black maternal line. Important note, not all women have wombs, not all people with wombs are women. Please don't be transphobic. Here's a modification of an Audrey Wallen meme. Beware a male artist making work about emptiness. Nothing does not belong to you. Back off, fuckers. Black women own the void. Okay, holy shit, that was super long, sorry. Thank you for uh, sitting through all of that. Hope that you found it interesting at least a little bit. But uh, here's the conclusion. We looked at examples in both secular and religious contexts from visual and written expression, music and rhythm, and philosophy. And we explored how abstraction is black and brown in origin, focusing on blackness. The key to rejecting missing linkism in historical analysis, or uh, missing linkism as the positioning of enslavement in the Middle Passage is necessary or unavoidable. Um, the key to avoiding missing linkism is to avoid the concept of artist philosophy as a catch-all for human activity to, be, to begin with, since they're so laden with Eurocentrism, and instead use a more generalized frame. I try to propose abstraction as one such frame. It's unclear if that's successful, right? But uh, that's the proposal. Spirit could be another frame. Function and figuration are not mutually exclusive with abstraction in the African traditions. Neither are meaning and uh, legibility, right? Neither are meaning and abstraction. They have a kin relationship. Further, site-specific spiritual functionality expressed with whatever is at hand is an African abstract gesture par excellence, ref refracting with great power across the diaspora and things like syncretism, yard art, etc. The reconstruction of the timeline of abstraction should privilege the maternal line, since it's here that we often see retention and reproduction of African cultures. Alright, thank you. Take care, everyone.